Richard, stage is yours. All right. So hello, everybody. It's nice to see you all. This is our session called High Performance Teams. It's about this stuff called core protocols. It's about psychological safety. It's about emotional intelligence. It's about having an awesome team. I'm Richard Kasparowski. I run a program called Certified Agile Team Building. I've got a list of courses, training uh, that I do. I've written a couple of books about teams and, and having awesome teams. I teach a couple of courses at universities. I created and teach a course called Agile Software Development at Harvard. Uh, we just started the semester here in the United States last week. And I contribute to a fellowship at Boston University that's focused on innovation and innovation teams. And in both courses, people build real products using the skills that, that we share, using the skills that they learn in class. So it's, it's totally hands-on. People build products and launch companies. You've got my contact info here. That's so you can keep in touch with me, so we can keep in touch with each other. Uh, you can email me, SMS, text message me. You can, you can reach me anytime, any way you want to, and I will get back to you. Meanwhile, you can ask questions as we go. And anything we don't get to right now, uh, you can get in touch with me later. We're going to do some interactions. I don't, I don't lecture. Uh, I'll, I'll share some, some content. I'll tell you a few things. But we're also going to do a lot of interacting. One of the ways we'll interact is using Manti. Uh, so join us on Manti. Uh, one way to join us is to, in your web browser on your desktop, type menti.com and then type that code 41076427. Yeah, and tap one of those icons when you get there. That's, that's how we'll, we'll know that you arrived. If the back of your web browser looks like this, you could aim the back of your web browser at that QR code. That would totally work. And if you didn't get to it just now, don't worry. It's going to say menti.com and I'll have that code number at the top of the page anytime we do something in menti. I'd like to start by asking this question. It's about you. It's about the best team of your life. What's the best team you were ever on in your entire life? And by team, what I mean is a group of two or more people aligned with common goals. That's a team. A group of two or more people aligned with a common goal. And it could be any kind of team, any, any group of two or more people aligned with a common goal. This could be a work team. Maybe the work team you're on right now. Maybe a work team from your past. Or somebody recently told me it was a singing group. They're part of a chorus. They get together and it's rather large. It's like 20 or 30 voices singing together in perfect harmony. That's their best team. Somebody told me their fishing group. They go out fishing every Saturday morning and that's their best team. Or I watch my wife Molly knitting with other people. And they're creating things they couldn't create solo. You know, even there, they're knitting individually. They're teaching each other skills. They're sharing information. They're inspiring each other to create things that they wouldn't otherwise be able to create. Or my wife, Molly, and me. It's two or more people. We're aligned with common goals. That might be the best team of my life. What's the best team of your life? And I really just want you to identify that team in your head. What was that team or what is that team? Who are those people? What, what is the activity? And take yourself back to that team. Maybe close your eyes. Sometimes people do this as a sort of a guided meditation. Try it. Close your eyes. Most of us have cameras off, so it's totally safe. Even with camera on, it's totally safe. Close your eyes. Take yourself back to that group of people. What's that best team of your life? Visualize them. Visualize yourselves as a group doing the activity. Visualize each person individually. Who are the people? Look at their faces. What other senses can you bring in? What does it sound like to be with that best team of your life? What does it feel like? What does it feel like against your skin or through your hair? Is there, is there a breeze? Is there some air conditioning or heat blowing? Is, what else do you hear? Are you inside? Are you outside? What are the sounds around you? What does it smell like? Bring in all your senses. 
as you go back to this team doing whatever that activity was that you're doing together. And now do the activity, do the work or whatever the activity was, do it mentally. And as you do that activity with that group of people, as you, you've taken yourself back to that group, what does it feel like within your body now? Notice how it feels, I don't know, within your chest, within your shoulders, within your belly. And that feeling, sensation, that sensation of the best team of your life, if you could express it in one word, what is that one word that you would use for the best team of your life? That team, in one word. And this chart is actually a histogram. If multiple people typed the same word, that word is bigger than the others. So in our group, 96 of us, 55 of us have, have typed a word. It's trust, the best team of our life, that one word is trust, or it's fun, or it's awesome, or it's love, or aligned. Family, unity, safe and cozy, daring, relieved. <laughs> it's Elena. <laughs> it's cohesion, it's openness, it's compassion. It's all of these words. This is the feeling of the best team of our lives. This is the sensation. This is the qualitative sense of the best team of our lives in one word. And I, I've been on some really great teams. I've been on some pretty mediocre teams as well. On those best teams of my life, I've felt all of these things and experienced all of these sensations. And probably, probably all of us have. And I've been on some teams that weren't so great. I always wanted to be able to get back into this state of being on purpose, to be able to have the best team of my life again on purpose. So that's what this session is about. It's how to get into that state of being of the best team of your life, how to do it on purpose. Many times I've gotten lucky. Sometimes we knew something. I've been reading a lot, studying a lot, doing a tiny bit of original research. We've been learning how to get back into the state of being on purpose, intentionally. We're going we're gonna to do some more of this today. So to get there, we're going to look at some science and research on high-performing teams. We're going to look at some practices and practice these practices to help us build some new habits to get into that state of being best team of your life intentionally. When I share this with some of my students in a university setting, sometimes I tell them this, that as they form teams to innovate something, to build a new product together, they always have a problem. Something always happens. There's some issue that happens amongst the humans in that team. And this thing that we're doing right now, it's a how-to guide. It's a very practical guide to help us overcome some of those challenges, surmount those issues, and have a great team that builds awesome products Always. So we'll start with science and research. A very quick tour through some of the science and research on teams and high-performing teams. One easy way to tell the story is to talk about this work Google did. This was published five years ago uh, in the New York Times Magazine. They started the research something like five years before that. In the 50 years before that, lots of different people have done research on teams and team performance. And there are like 250 different characteristics of high-performing teams, 250 different attributes that, depending on the researcher and the research they were doing, they say that this thing that they discovered, it's the one thing you need for a high-performing team. There's 250 of these one things that you need for a high-performing team. That's too many. So at Google and at other companies, they've tried to figure out which of those 250 things really is the thing that matters for them, for their people. At Google, they hired the right kinds of people, scientists, uh, researchers, psychologists, statisticians, who could conduct the research, who could reproduce the research that's already happened. They got about 200 teams to volunteer to participate in reproducing the research. They measured them on their performance. They measured them on various of these 250 different attributes. And they found that the one thing that mattered the most for these teams at Google was psychological safety. Safety, in this sense, is how you feel here and how you feel here in your heart when you're with your teammates. 
it's the sensation that you, well, you feel safe when you're together. You can take risks. You can try something new. You can admit you don't know something. You can ask for help. You can show up as yourself, as you really are. You don't have to wear a metaphorical mask. You can be you all the time when you're with your teammates. And the research is really solid on this. Teams that measure high on psychological safety measure high on performance. And this cuts across all different industries, all different locales and cultures. I went and saw a new dentist about five years ago. I told her what I was doing for work. She pulled out the paper version of her dental office magazine, and it was all about safety. Safety amongst the workers at the office. It's okay to admit you made a mistake. You don't get blamed for things, for example. And that dental teams and all kinds of work teams, all kinds of creative teams, when people feel safe, they do better at what they're doing. Now, the work at Google to reproduce this research, the work in academia, they measure safety, they measure performance, and they tell you to do more safety, and, and that's where it stops. They don't tell you how to get more safety. So that's interesting. There's some related research. I told the story to Steve Wolf. Steve and his co-author, his research partner, Vanessa Druskett, did a bunch of research around the same time as the psychological safety research. And they found in their research that psychological safety was a subset of a broader thing that they called team emotional intelligence. Team emotional intelligence is the sense that we understand how we're doing individually and collectively. We can behave the right way no matter how we're feeling. We can understand how people outside of our team are doing. And we can influence them to do the right things to help us succeed and to help all of us in the organization succeed. We feel safe together and we feel safe in our larger organization. We have executive support. The executives trust us and they give us all the resources we need to get the job done. This is all part of team emotional intelligence and that teams that measure high in team emotional intelligence, they measure high in performance. Like all good research, there's really strong correlation. It's been reproduced. And then the research stops there. They don't tell us how to get more team emotional intelligence. So we got something related. This is not academic research. This is something that's the work of Jim McCarthy and Michelle McCarthy. They did observational research. They had this experience of having a really amazing work team that was measurably better than other work teams, both inside their organization and around the world. And they experienced all of those qualitative sensations that we've experienced in our best teams ever. And they realized maybe they got lucky. They hoped to be able to do it again. They left that company and they started up a team research lab. In their lab, they would give teams, groups of people, an assignment in five days to get it done, and they would watch and just observe, not intervene in any way. They noticed that successful teams in their lab shared common behaviors. There were certain things that they did that the other successful teams also did. They hypothesized that if they could teach those behaviors to other teams, then other teams would be successful as well. So they distilled these shared behaviors into little patterns, little scripts. They called them protocols. A protocol is a clearly defined way for multiple people to communicate to ensure that they meet their goals and to minimize misunderstandings. So they defined 11 protocols that they noticed teams in their lab engaging in, the successful teams in their lab engaged in these protocols together as teammates. And by using these behaviors, they were successful teams. They called them the core protocols because there were more, there were many, many, many protocols and, and these were the 11 most important ones. Well, they redid their research this time as experiment introducing a variable. They would give a team an assignment in five days to get it done and give them these protocols from successful teams. And every time they did that, the teams were successful. They tried this in industry. Every time they did that, real teams doing real work were successful. They've done this for many, many different kinds of teams in many, many geographic locales. It seems to hold up across all different kinds of work, across all different cultures. And this is the how-to. Steve Wolf and I have mapped the core protocols to 
the research on team emotional intelligence and to the research on psychological safety. These are the how-to for getting high group emotional intelligence and high safety in your group and in your organization. These tell you how to do it. So here's another way to look at it. It's that if you want a high-performance team, and you probably do, that's, that's why you're here, that's why you stuck around and waited for me, you definitely want psychological safety. The research is really solid. And psych safety is a subset of team emotional intelligence. You definitely want that if you want a high-performance team. And if you want to know how to get high team EI and high psych safety, core protocols are one way to do it, a set of behaviors that can get you there. From here, we're, let's look at the actual behaviors. Let's look at the skills, and we'll try them together. So I build this up as a set of building blocks. The first building block is positive bias. The idea of positive bias is that we orient ourselves, our teammates orient themselves toward positive outcomes. Whatever we say, whatever we do, however we act, all of our behavior is oriented toward achieving our goals together. So it means non-negativity, not being negative. It means being positive. It means no negation, which is a way of saying we don't automatically say no to each other. It means pretend or suspend disbelief. As if someone offered you a new idea, like I might during the next half hour, 45 minutes, you'll pretend that it's a good idea for long enough to try it out, either mentally do a mental experiment or even try it out with other people, to collect your own data, to be empirical about it, to be evidence-based about it, to try it out for yourself and see whether it works versus automatically saying no and discounting the idea. So let's try something right now. We're going to do an activity in small groups. I'm going to put us in Zoom in groups of three because sometimes things happen and somebody doesn't end up in a group and Sometimes there's little technology glitches. It's totally okay. What we're going to do in our group is, with the people who show up in your group, make a plan for lunch tomorrow. As if you could really have lunch tomorrow. You'll have 60 seconds to make a plan for lunch tomorrow with your partners. There's a catch to make it interesting. Whatever your partner says, when it's your turn to respond, your response will start with the words, yes, but, or whatever the equivalent is in your shared language. This doesn't have to be in English. So whatever your partner says, you respond with the words yes, but, and then you finish your response. Oh, and you'll have 60 seconds to do this. Here's an example. Hi, partner, you want to have lunch tomorrow? And your partner will say, yes, but we're in different parts of Germany or we're in different countries around the world. So that's going to be too hard. And then you'll respond starting with yes, but yes, but maybe we could find a way to do it like through Zoom or something. And your partner will say, yes, but I don't meet people for lunch on Zoom. I'm trying to minimize how much Zoom I use. Yes, but maybe you could make an exception. Yes, but yes, but yes, but that's the activity. Actually try to make a plan for lunch tomorrow. And you always respond starting with the words yes, but. Are there any questions about this activity? Okay, here we go. You're going to be in your activity space for 60 seconds. If you make it there, do the activity. If you have trouble with the activity, don't worry. It's only 60 seconds. We'll come back together and we'll talk about it at the end. Here we go. Wow, you brought us up way too early. <laughs> Welcome back. It's nice to see you all again. Yeah, too early. I know, it's just a 60 seconds activity, but don't worry. Let's do a second version of the activity. So the second version of the activity, you know, this is an agile group, I suppose. So the second version of the activity, we'll, we'll iterate on this and see what happens. And the second iteration, try responding to your partner with the words yes and at the beginning of each response. Try to make a plan for lunch tomorrow with your partner or partners. Every time you respond to your partner, start with the words yes and. For example, hi partner, want to have lunch together tomorrow? Your partner will say yes. And even though we're in different cities and different places in the world, uh, we could use Zoom or something. 
that would totally work. And you'll say yes. And um, even though I don't normally don't do extra Zoom outside of work, we'll make an exception so we can have a good lunch and be like, yes, and blah, blah, blah. Yes, and blah, blah, blah. Yes, and as the starting words in your response to each other. Are there any questions about this version of the activity? All right, we'll have 60 seconds. See if you can make a plan for lunch tomorrow. Here we go. Well, hi, everybody. Welcome back. It's nice to see you again. How did that go for you? Let's debrief. The yes, but version. What are some facts about yes, but? You could share with your voice if you want, or you could share in Zoom chat. Yes, it was but. Easy to get stuck. You got stuck. Anybody else have an experience like that? Negativity. There's some negativity. No, for us, it was just too short. But <laughs> it was too short. Yeah, yeah. We had just time to make a few exchanges and tack, it was uh, finished. So. And yes, but felt pretty frustrating, to be it honest. Frustrating. Yeah. That a couple of times, yeah. yeah. Everybody had their guards on, it seems. Everybody had their guards on. Yes, but it's like there's no resolution. It's like blocking. It's like we're we're looking for barriers. It's like we're trying to make excuses. How about yes and? What was yes and like for you? Much more cooperative. It was more fun. It was more fun. You're Much partnering. More. Much more ideas. It was fun. It was fun. <laughs> All right. It's broader discussion. Uh, it was smooth and goal oriented. It was a positive attitude. This is what people usually report. All we did was change one word. Instead of saying but, we said and. And that's all it took to get us more fun, more positivity, more collaboration. This is an example. This isn't a prescription or a script. This isn't, isn't even one of the protocols. It's the foundational idea. The foundational idea is orient toward getting what we want together, orient toward positive actions, positive results. Think about what you say. Think about your body language. Think about everything that goes into positive affect. Getting that deeper connection with each other, even just for a, a silly activity like this. Something you can try with your team. Just change but to end. Be careful about what you say and how you say it. We'll add on to that with a building block called freedom. So the story I told about how Core Protocols was discovered or identified or collected was by watching high-performing teams, and then by testing it with random teams. So it's evidence-based. When we look at the evidence and we look at successful teams, one of the things we notice is that they have autonomy. The members of the team have autonomy and freedom. Each individual gets to decide things like whether they are part of that team and what happens to them when they're part of that team, what they choose to do, what they decide not to do. You could look at the core commitments, and there's a short URL here to get you there. Core commitments could be a default team agreement. Uh, people in chat were writing phrases like working agreements. Core commitments could be your working agreements, and they basically say, we'll keep things positive. Uh, we won't do things that are dumb on purpose. We'll use these core protocols. And then pass and check out are the names of two of these protocols, the names of two of these behaviors. We have short URLs to help you find these behaviors. Pass goes like this. Anytime you're doing something with your team, that group of two or more people with whom you have shared goals, and you want to opt out of some activity, you want to not do the activity, you just say, I pass. And the people on your team, if they've seen the core protocols, they, they, they'll know what you mean. And what you mean is, I'm not going to participate in this, in this activity, but I'm still part of the team. I'm going to stay here with you. And nobody hassles you. Nobody tries to get you to do the activity anyway. You get to decide whether you do the activity or not. Nobody talks about you for passing. Nobody asks you why you're passing. Nobody tries to force you to do the activity. If any of these things happened, it wouldn't be safe to pass. So by not doing these behaviors, we build a higher sense of trust and safety with each other. We, it, it, anytime you don't want to do something, it's totally okay. It's safe to opt out. Check out is kind of like pass, but it's even stronger. It's like pass and more. Anytime you want to opt out of the team temporarily, even more strongly in, in the sense that you don't want to be with them temporarily, or maybe you have something more important to do 
at the moment. You just say, I'm, I'm checking out and you leave. So in, in physical space, I'm checking out and you leave would be like, you leave the room. In digital space, I'm checking out and I leave. It could be like, I turn off my video and my microphone. It could be that you exit Zoom. You decide for yourself or your team decides what it means to check out in digital space, but it could be you just leave the meeting. Here's the thing about the safety of checking out. Nobody asks you why you're checking out. You could explain why, but nobody forces you to explain why. Nobody tries to make you stay in. Nobody chases you and tries to pull you back into the activity or the meeting. Nobody messages you asking why or trying to get you to rejoin. You check out, you check out. It's up to you to come back. It could even be like this. I got a message from my wife. I actually did. I'm checking out. And you go do your thing and you come back and you check back in. But it could be like that. When I'm with you, dear teammates, I am 100% with you. I'm not doing anything else. This is what we see on the best of the best teams. When we're together, we're together doing our thing. We're not distracted by other things. There's nothing more important to do than the thing we're doing right now. If there is something more important to do, go do it. You should always be doing the most important thing. It would be foolish not to. But if that other thing is not more important, then boom, I am here with you and we are doing our thing. Our, this is the most important thing. If you need to check out, you check out. Totally okay with your teammates. And ooh, remember, the evidence is that this is what people do on the best of the best teams, on high-performing teams. We'll add on to that. These are some easy behaviors that you could adopt with your team. We'll add on, add on to that with this building block called self-awareness. We've got three behaviors for self-awareness. Check in, ask for help, personal alignment. You can read all the details at those short URLs. The idea here is that when we look at high-performing teams, the individuals on the team have really high self-awareness. They know who they are. They know why they are there. They know individually what is important to them. They have some idea of how to pursue what's important to them. They can articulate what they want and how they feel and what they're thinking. That's self-awareness. So here's an example of a habit that you could build individually to build more self-awareness. This is a solo, quiet thinking activity. Fill in the blank on this sentence. You could do this on a piece of paper. You could just you could write that sentence and complete the sentence with any word or words that describe how you are feeling right now. And then we'll do a second iteration of this. The second iteration is multiple choice. How are you feeling right now? And which one of these words, or it could be more than one of these words, but how are you feeling right now? Choose one of these four words, glad, sad, mad, or afraid. Happy, sad, angry, or afraid. Which one is closest to how you feel right now? And then add more information. What else is going into your emotional state right now? What else about how you feel right now? Let's collect some information again. This is one way to gauge how we're feeling as a group. Back in Menti, I feel blank, glad, sad, mad, or afraid. How do you feel? So I believe this because the full spectrum of emotions is represented in our group. A bunch of us are feeling happy, a few of us are sad, a few of us are afraid, and a couple of us are angry. We know more about ourselves individually and together. This information or information like this could help us as we do our work or our activity, whatever our activity is together. Let's do an activity in small groups. We'll do this in our groups of three, approximately three people. The activity is to talk to each other and share how you're feeling. Now, you already know how you're feeling from the first part of the activity. You wrote it down on a piece of paper, maybe. You just answered it in Menti. We're going to communicate it to one of our teammates. And we've got a script on the left-hand side. This is your script. All you have to do is read the script out loud when it's your turn. Everybody will take a turn. When it's your turn, 
you'll say, I feel glad, sad, mad, or afraid. You could explain more about what's going into that feeling. You could repeat steps one and two if you want. You can do it more than once. Oh, you could pass. Remember pass? You could just say, I pass. That's number three. And when you're done, number four, say, I'm in. And then your partners will say, welcome. I'm in is sort of like, I'm done. And welcome is sort of like, we heard you. Here's an example. So this is what you'll do when it's your turn. Something like this, not exactly this. This is me. You're going you're gonna to do it for you. I feel glad. I'm super happy to be here. I'm happy you waited for me. I'm mad that I was confused about the time, our start time today. Mad at myself uh, for having made that error. I'm so glad that you all waited, that we're, we're doing it together right now. Uh, I am sad. My stepdaughter, she's in high school. We have challenges in our relationship, and I'm, I'm sad about that. Am I afraid about anything? At the moment, I am not afraid about anything. I'm in. And now, welcome. Ah, there we go. Perfect. <laughs> Thanks for modeling the welcome. After somebody checks in, you say welcome. You know they checked in because they say, I'm in. So, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to start breakout rooms right now. There's approximately three people in each group. We'll do this for about three minutes and we'll talk about it when we get back together. Are there any che questions about this emotion check in that we're about to do? All right, looks like we're all back. Welcome back. Let's talk about this. Let's debrief uh, this emotion check-in. How did it go for you? What happened? You can share with your voice or you can share in chat. There was some kind of closeness and understanding coming in pretty quickly. Like I was with a partner who I had never met before and now I feel like I know her a bit. And since we have that appointment for lunch tomorrow, that'll be fun. <laughs> <laughs> A brand new acquaintance, and uh, just like that, boom, emotion check in, and you feel like you know her. Same here, actually. I'm super surprised that this opens up more, uh, I don't know how to say this, but um, I wasn't expecting to hear this, actually. It's an trust, honesty thingy. Yeah, surprising, and trust right away. People are writing in chat, it felt good, I enjoyed it. I got to know more about the team, that group of people you were with. This is a way to accelerate connection with each other, right? If nothing else, and you start to trust each other more, you start to feel closer. And we know from watching high-performing teams that this is something that happens. They, they have a way to share how they're feeling. And they feel safer by doing that as a habit, doing it regularly. You could do this anytime you want. Do this anytime your emotional state changes. Share it with the people around you. Let them know. You could do it at the beginning of every meeting. You could do it at a retro. Somebody adds in chat. You could do it every day at your daily scrum or your daily stand-up or if you have some sort of daily meeting. You could add an important piece of information and do it. Well, if you do it every day, it starts to be a habit. It starts to become normal. It starts to be how your team operates. Now your team operates with higher emotional intelligence. And we know from the research and from the observations, teams with higher group emotional intelligence perform better than other teams. Here's another one for self-awareness. I want blank. Fill in the blank. What do you want right now? But not just, you know, where I am, it's, it's, it's time for afternoon coffee. It's not just, I want my afternoon coffee. Maybe where you are, it's time for your evening wine or there's something you want to watch on Netflix or it's time to go to bed. That's good. But what do you really want? What's the biggest, most important thing in the world for you? Think big, 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 big. Like, I want COVID solved or I want world peace. What is the biggest thing for you individually? It doesn't have to be COVID solved or world peace. It's your big thing. What is your big thing that you want? What's your biggest want? Think and write down your answer. Can we be selfish? I require you to be selfish. This is your want. What do you want? Your biggest want. Not, not a little thing, a big thing. Your most selfish want. And then the next question is, Wow. If that's the biggest thing in the world for you, you should have it already. You could be orienting all of your energy, all your actions, everything you say, everything you do 
could be in the pursuit of that big, important want. But it's not, because if it was, we, you wouldn't say you want it. You would say you have it. Or maybe you have some of it, but you want all of it, whatever that thing is. What's blocking you? Why don't you have it? Or why don't you have all of it? What's in your way? Answer that question for yourself and write down your answer. And then we'll do a second iteration of I want blank. This time it's multiple choice. Here are your choices. Imagine that one of these words is your future superpower. You'll practice to build this superpower within you. And once you have this superpower, it will destroy everything that's blocking you and get you everything you want. Which one of these words, if it were your superpower, would get you everything you want? Is it self-awareness, integrity, courage, passion, peace, presence, self-care, fun, wisdom, or health? Pick from one of those 10. And you get to define what the word means for you. Your definition might be different from my definition, and that's fine. This is your future superpower. If you're not sure which one to pick, the default answer is self-awareness. I miss the days of doing this in physical space when people would laugh out loud at little jokes like that. But it's not really a joke. If you're not sure what you want, maybe you want self-awareness. <laughs> Woohoo! Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll be here all week. Oh, and we're going to call this, whichever one you picked, we're going to call that your personal alignment. This is another protocol. The protocol is this script for figuring out what you want and figuring out a way to practice it. So the next step is to take that personal alignment, that virtual virtue word, and turn it into a habit. How could you practice it every day? For example, my personal alignment right now is I want courage. A way that I practice it for me, courage, is like I'm afraid to do things. One of the things I'm afraid to do or I just don't do enough is ask for help. So instead of being afraid to ask for help, well, I still am afraid to ask for help. I just don't do it enough. My practice, my habit is to ask for help every day, at least once. I could add on. I could make that even better. And I could write it down in my journal. Today, I'll put today's date, I asked blank for help, person name for help. And then some description of the help I asked for. What would you do? How could you practice your future superpower every day and turn it into your actual superpower? And which one did you pick? Which one is your future superpower? If we were a team and we had all the superpowers, we would be a really awesome team. Oh, and this is about team building and having a high performance team. Another step in this is to share your superpower, your future superpower with your teammates and ask each other for help building that superpower. And notice when somebody is practicing their superpower and support them as they practice their future superpower. And they support you as you practice your future superpower. Wouldn't that be cool if we told everybody in our team not only how we feel, but what we care about the most, and they helped us get it. This is what happens on the best of the best teams. And here's a way to do it. So you could do this with your team. Maybe your team will be one of the best of the best. From here, the next building block, now that we've got this bias toward positivity, we've got people who understand that it's okay to opt in and to opt out. We've got high self-awareness. Now we connect together into a cohesive whole, a team. We've got some behaviors for that. Well, you experience this. When you do the emotion check-in with each other, that's also a connection activity. Asking for help, it's a thing people do on high-performing teams. It's for self-awareness and connection. Personal alignment, well, we also connect with each other when we share what our future superpower is. Then we have other skills, other habits, like intention check and investigate. You can look through those short URLs, find all the details. These are skills for asking open questions, uh, for finding out more about what's going on within the team and within other humans. These are ways to connect that feel really safe. They're about being curious, about just asking open questions and trying to get more information, not judging, listening to the answers, not telling people what to do, just hearing. And what we notice when people go through 
all of these activities, including investigate and tension check, that in a very, very fast, very short period of time, they start to feel really connected. They start to really feel like a team, not just a group of people doing similar work. The sensation that they feel, somebody, a couple of people have typed this word as the sensation of the best teams of their life. We get into the state where we're not only a high-performing team, where all of those sensations that people wrote, and we feel this sensation above all of them. We feel love. We feel like we love each other as teammates. And this is what it really means to be on a high-performing team. If you watched a high-performing team, it would look like a group of people who love each other, a group of people who care about each other, a group of people for whom the others matter to them. If love is not a word you can use in your team, in your company, in your organization, you could use this word instead. You could call it friendship. This is what we mean, really intense friendship. And this activity set is a recipe for getting into that state of being together, love or friendship. If you think about the best relationship of your life in a team, a work team, any kind of team, is a relationship. You start with positive bias. You orient yourselves on purpose toward getting what you want individually and together, not toward destroying it or negating anything, toward getting what you want together. You have freedom. You get to choose who are the other people in the relationship. Nobody forces you into a relationship. You get to decide. Check in. In those best relationships of your life, you share how you're feeling with each other. They share how they're feeling with you. And nobody judges you for how you're feeling. They listen and they support personal alignment. You share with the other people what is important to you, and they share with you what's important to them, and you support each other on it, and you investigate. You connect even more deeply by asking and listening. So this is a reproducible recipe for love or friendship. It's a reproducible recipe for a great team. And if that love and friendship stuff doesn't resonate with you, we could do it as code as well. This is like a script that every member of the team could run in their brains. And it's everything we just did. Just like a script that you could run if, if our brains were computers. Add on to that, we're talking about high performance teams. So there's something happening. There's some act of creation. I call this building block productivity. We have behaviors for making decisions together. How to make the best decisions together. Here's a behavior for that, learned by watching high-performing teams. We have a behavior for conflict resolution. We have a behavior for asking for giving and receiving feedback. That's what these three are, decider, resolution, and perfection game. And we've got the final, the sixth building block called error handling, and a behavior that's called protocol check because these are protocols. What it really is, is that on high-performing teams, they have a way, a totally safe way, to let each other know that they had a team agreement and somebody violated the team agreement or somebody did something different and get back on track. Nobody gets in trouble for saying that we didn't do the thing we agreed. Instead, we get back on track. That's what protocol check is about. So we've looked at a lot of stuff. I'm curious what you think is the most important thing that you heard. What's the most interesting thing that I shared or we practiced together? <music> Oh, and definitely say something else <laughs> if you have something else to add on. I'd love to hear what your something else is. You can type it in chat or you could message me later on. Yeah, so our key takeaway, core protocols are a way to raise team emotional intelligence. Friendship is congruent with a high-performance team. Team EI can help you raise psychological safety. There is science and research on high-performance teams. And there's a couple of something else's. Another look at that. If you want a high-performance team, you want psych safety. You want to emotional intelligence and you want a way to do it, habits to build to get there. Core protocols are an example of a set of behaviors, habits you could build to get you all of that. All of this will help you resolve team dynamics problems and have a really great team. How to do this for your team. You can take some of what we did just now and copy it. Just do it with your team. That's one way to do this. You could read one of these books. You could ask me for help anytime. You could visit that website, thecoreprotocols.org. It's totally free. You could learn and practice these behaviors. You could just practice them yourself. You could introduce them to other people you care about. We've got more events like this coming up. 
every Wednesday. I do an office hour. You're invited. Just come, hang out, bring a topic, bring a question. If you want to practice one of these behaviors, we can practice a, a protocol together. If you've got something on your mind, we can talk about it. Whatever you want to do, just show up at the office hours every Wednesday. We're doing a product owner skills session as part of Project Management Institute, Minnesota. That's a state in the United States. We're doing that later this month. Every first Thursday of the month, we do another free event called the Agile Dojo. We learn something about Agile by practicing something together. I have dozens of Miro templates, for example, that help us either get work done in a playful way or learn something about Agile. We often do one of those activities. We're doing a class, a class on this stuff. If you want to go really deep into this stuff, either yourself or with your team, join us at the Agile Arizona conference in November, where we will do a class on high performance team building. So we'll start to like build some of these skills into habits. Or you could book a class for your team. We do this as a private class. Any one of the classes that I offer, any other coaching or skill building that you'd like help with, ask me for the help. Oh, finally, this is actually one of the activities. Perfection game is that way to ask for and, and give and receive feedback. Here's a version of perfection game that we could do on a computer. Will you help me make this kind of presentation the best it could possibly be? So back in Menti, I have three questions for you. The questions are to give this a score from one to 10. 10 would be, it's already the best it could be. One would be, uh, you, you have a lot of work to do to make this better. But the second question is, what did you like about this session? What was good about it? So I could do more of that. The third question is, what else would it take to be the best? What else would it take to be a perfect 10? Will you play Perfection Game as our final activity? Will you give me feedback on this session that we just did? If you have that Perfection Game feedback in progress, keep going. Thank you for the feedback. I, I really appreciate it. I, I read every one of them. And I thank you for joining us today. Thanks for participating in the activities. Thanks for playing along. Uh, thanks for all the interaction, especially as we debriefed on activities. Don't forget, these are different ways you can keep in touch with me. And you are absolutely invited and welcome to, to keep in touch with me. That's it. Thanks again. Richard, thank you so much for spending your time with us. That was really That's awesome. Right. I took a note, office hours. This is a good idea. I really like it. I used to do this in person years ago, but somehow it, uh, I lost sight of that. We get Running people well. from all over the world joining us for office hours with different perspectives. It's, I always learn something. So are there any questions? Uh, as long as Richard is with us, uh, you may want to ask him something. Yeah, you could ask with your voice. You could ask in chat. Whatever works for you. What did you do before you started with um, the protocols and all this high performance team stuff? What did I do before this? Um, I grew up as a software developer. And what got me on this path was I, I got into this agile stuff as a software developer, I discovered these things that people call extreme programming and later these things that people call scrum. I noticed things about myself. I started learning about emotional intelligence and these kinds of things. Um, I, I started to get really interested in us as a group more than me as an individual person on a team. Like I, I felt like I could do anything. I could write code that would do anything. I don't really know if that's true, but it's what I thought. I started to get more and more interested in us as a group. I noticed that we were way more creative and we were way more powerful than me. And that, that's what that's what led me down this path. Another question from Martin in Berlin. Like, I really like what you presented here today. I know a lot of it from more circles of of personal development or impro theater. So I really dig that that you brought it into a business and developing context. <laughs> How would you deal with somebody on the team who is like not into this touchy feely stuff? Let me call it. But yeah. into, just let me do my work and let me do my programming and leave me alone with all the other stuff. Yeah, we hear that a lot, don't we? Yeah, just, just let me do my work. I'm not into this touchy-feely stuff. Yeah. You know, I joked. Maybe the word love isn't allowed where you were. Did you notice that I started with the research in science? Ah, yeah. That's a hook for those people who are not into emotion. 
Turns out, according to the hard research, that teams that share how they're feeling with each other outperform other teams. So if you want to be on a really awesome team, building really great products together that people love, well, the research says we should try doing more emotional intelligence. And maybe that's an opening for those people. Yeah, that is clever. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that one. Right. Anything else? Other questions or comments? Oh, some people are writing in chat. How do I start following these core protocols and use them in my team? First explain them and then start using them. You could try that. You could you could explain them. You could start using them. You could you know, share these with people. You could do exactly what I just did. Uh, or you could just start modeling them. You know, you could, if you don't want to do something on your team, you could just say, I pass. You could opt out. If you have something more important to do, instead of, you know, trying to do some email while you're in a work session with your team, you could just leave and do that email and not waste their time with half of you. Come back with 100% of you. Uh, you could spontaneously share how you're feeling. And there's a really good chance that somebody will copy what you just did. I did this once with a really short-lived team. I was on... Um, we do this thing in the United States. We, we have criminal juries, like somebody gets accused of a crime and there's a bunch of us. We get called together and we decide whether the person is guilty or innocent. That That's a team. So I, I took some of these ideas into a criminal jury once. I was, I was a member of a jury. And I didn't tell anybody about any of this stuff. It, it really mattered to me whether we got the right answer. I wanted us to be a, a high-performing team. I just shared how I was feeling with the group and the next person shared how they were feeling. They copied me. We have these things that people call mirror neurons. We copy each other. Make sure that you do positive things so people will copy positive things in your team. The third person copied us, shared how they were feeling. The fourth person, we didn't teach anybody this, but the fourth person said, I don't want to share how I'm feeling. That was an example of pass. They just figured out, that, oh, nobody asked her to do it anyway. It was totally safe. So we, we started to build some trust as well as emotional understanding. The fifth person shared how they were feeling. The sixth person passed. You could just try it. And there's a good chance that because of this thing called mirror neurons, people will copy you. Thanks for that example. How, how do you, like, if I want to try that out in the daily, how do you balance um, between having people in breakout rooms, but then just a small group, like if you have a team of eight, would you rather share it with everyone with the risk of people being tired in between? Or would you rather do small breakout groups, groups to con connect a bit more? What size group? This, this works at team scale. And you use eight as, as an example of, of one of your mm -hmm. teams. That's a good size for sharing how we feel. This is like a daily scrum or something. Then you've got a 15 minute maximum if you're, if you're doing that. Uh, people learn fast to, you know, keep themselves within that maximum. Um, when I do this with groups, okay, actually, I usually get frustrated with how long it takes for everybody to check in. That's just me. I, I like to go fast and get, get stuff done. But we always go faster and we're always more creative and we always get more stuff done after we have invested in just sharing how we feel with each other. Everything else is better. So it's, it, from my experience, it, it's really worthwhile. No matter how long it takes. You mentioned before that uh, there's this checkout where you can just check out and then leave or whatever and then nobody would ask you why or no. in, the, in that case, I wonder how do you then, uh, let's say, solve the problem if there is any problem if, if there is the agreement that you don't need to know which i think it's okay but how do you then address the situation yeah okay so what about checking out there's there's like two at least two interesting questions related to checking out what if somebody checks out a lot like they're they choose to not be part of the team a lot that's that's actually really good information that they're not really part of the team 
And and maybe we're all better off if that person chooses the right team for themselves. If there's if there's always something more important than us, they should probably go do that thing for themselves. Why wouldn't they do something, do the most important thing for themselves? They they should. Uh, and if they're still sort of like hanging on to the team, you can you can investigate, you can intention check, you you can inquire about it in a in a safe, non judgmental kind of way. Uh, people often figure out that. They really belong on a different team, and they go there. Hey, Richard, um, thank you so much. This is so terrific. I, I too many words to express for the <laughs> Ray gratitude. Um, what have you learned about psychological safety since uh, the uh, emergence of, of COVID and people working in remote teams? And do you have any insights or tips or resources to uh, – point in that direction we've all found new and different ways to facilitate interactions within our teams uh here's a blog i wrote in which i'm sharing uh, a lot of the tools i've created uh, i just pasted that into chat so you can check that out there's a whole bunch of tools there that you might want to use with your team um we've found different ways to to do some of these team behaviors, right? So checking out in physical space, you leave the room. Checking out in digital space, that's different. Or how to do effective decision-making in digital space, it's different from in physical space. That decider protocol and resolution protocol, they work differently. Uh, So how do we do those in digital space? How could we do them asynchronously, but still make decisions rapidly? and resolve conflict rapidly. Some subtle changes to the protocols or these sorts of behaviors so that they work in digital space. Uh, Even emotion check-in, sharing how we're feeling. What if we were asynchronous? What would that look like? And would it be as effective? I'm not sure it's as effective, but at least we're getting more information than not sharing how we're feeling. Learning how to do these things in digital space and, and maybe even learning how to do them asynchronously versus synchronously all the time. Right. Well, I look forward to looking at that blog. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Somebody asks in chat, how do you deal with when someone on your team becomes defensive? When people, how they share, when people share how they're feeling while communicating with them. So I can imagine an example of this, like I'm mad about the way you did blank. Right, so now it's not just about me, it's about you. This is, this is actually really hard. I don't think anybody has a good answer for this. Uh, the intersection of the way I feel and the thing you did, which caused, I'm, I'm going to say it caused me to feel that way. Uh, an important thing to remember is that the way I feel, the way you feel, it's yours. And the way you respond to somebody else's behavior That's your response to their behavior. Somebody else might create the environment for you to react a certain way, but you control your reaction. You control your behavior, no matter how you're feeling. Right. So it's important to take for each one of us to take responsibility for how we're feeling and and, and how we're behaving, no matter what the other people around us are doing. And it's totally okay to say something like, I'm mad that we couldn't get something done, whatever it was, or, or maybe pull in some other practices. Many people know practices. I can't think of the name of the practice, but I always use this list of things. The behavior pattern is uh, you share observations, you share how you're feeling, you state your need, you make a request. Uh, oh, that's like, nonviolent communication. Nonviolent communication. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you can pull in other practices like nonviolent communication. You can pull in other practices. I noticed this happening. This is how I feel about it. This is what I need to feel differently to get what I want. And um, this is my request. This is actually like a mega protocol. It's combining lots of different things. It's, it's, uh, it's an emotion check-in. I'm saying what I, how I feel. It's, it's sort of like personal alignment. I'm saying, saying what I need. Uh, it's like ask for help. I'm making a request at the end. And I'm not forcing anybody to do that new behavior, but it, I'm making a request. Some practice like that might help with that sort of situation as well, where 
you know, colloquially, we say, somebody made me mad. Well, actually, you know, somebody might have done something, but they, they had their own positive bias. They were pursuing their own goals. And I got mad within myself. That nonviolent communication pattern might be a nice way to uh, communicate with each other nonviolently, safely. Stefan, what do you think? Excellent evening, I would say. <laughs> so, Richard, thank you so much for, for sharing your time with us. It was uh, really insightful. And uh, hopefully there will be an opportunity to repeat this next year, probably. I hope so. Th thanks so much for inviting me. And uh, thanks, everybody, for patiently awaiting me. I, 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 I love that you did that. Thank you so much. Again, Richard, thanks a lot for being with us today. Mm -hmm.